Hey everyone, Gil Gross here, and it is time for another mailbag where I answer your hot takes, questions, observations, and ultimately your comments about tennis or anything else. I posted in the YouTube community tab. You left your comments there. You left your comments on my Discord server. Link to that is in the description. We are almost at the end, folks. Last week of regular ATP events. Year-end championships on the ATP side next week, on the WTA side this week. Monday Match Analysis is going to drop Sunday. It's going to include my preview of the ATP Finals, semifinal predictions, looking at both groups, obviously my final and my champion. Uh, I do want to break down the final in Riyadh, the women's match, because that's going to be, you know, filled with more, you know, intrigue and star power. It's going to be Goff versus Zhang Chin Wen. Uh, and I want to break that down as well as probably I'll just choose one of the ATPs, but or maybe I'll touch briefly on both of them. I'm not sure. But I've been calling Mets all week for Tennis Channel and uh, T2. I'll be calling the final between Nori and uh, Benjamin Bonzi tomorrow. So I've been really locked in on Mets. So I might just talk about that. We'll see. All right. Uh, without further ado, let's get into these comments. We're going to start with uh, two that are kind of similar, uh, kind of uh, some synergy here. First one is from uh, Nick Kiels. Hey, Gil, why is Novak playing without a coach these days? I know that he's been on the tour for so long and has lots of experience, but surely a coach can help him get better in some areas of his game, like overheads and forehand drop shots. He has to improve and reinvent himself if he hopes to compete with Alcaraz and Sinner for the majors. Look, I think this is a really, like, good question. Such a good question that if I had Novak Djokovic in a press conference right now, it might be what I feel like asking him about. Hey, Novak, what has it been like playing this year without a main head tennis coach? How has that been different from past years when you've had folks like Ivan Isevich and Vida in your box? And is it something that you would consider keeping for the rest of your career, this kind of coachless vibe? I, I think that's a really interesting question. I'd be very curious to hear what Novak would say about that. That said, this is the mailbag, so I will give it a shot. Uh, I don't, look, I, I can't actually answer why is Novak playing without a coach, right? I, I assume there has not been anyone who he's found or looked at and determined, okay, this is my person. This is someone who I would want in my corner. And I think it's a, as you kind of become more and more experienced, I think it's harder to find someone who you kind of buy into. Also, perhaps Djokovic wants to really be clear on what he's looking for out of the rest of his career. And I think there's been a lot of introspection for him. What are my goals? What do I want out of this? And maybe he needs to sort that part out of it before he's ready to go out onto the market and try to create a partnership with with a coach so that they can kind of level on on the same terms. And I know that sounds a little bit wishy-washy, but I think that stuff is actually important. Uh, I want to address the technical aspect of this. First of all, careful. I say this all the time. I like to hammer it home. I think it's a bit of a fallacy out there among fans, that coaches come in and really hammer down on players' weaknesses. I like. I know I've said this before. You've probably heard me say this before. But I, I just think it's really important to understand that, first of all, no matter what coaches do, most tennis players are going to have strengths and weaknesses. And it is great to improve on weaknesses. The very, the very, very, very best, they improve their weaknesses. They become well-rounded. They patch up the bugs in their games. There's no doubt about that. But especially, like, depending on play style and depending on how big a weakness things really are and why they're weaknesses, like, there are some things that are just always going to be weaknesses. And it's unhelpful for a coach to come in there and just really focus on, like, trying to fix somebody in their weakest areas when ultimately you have so many other jobs as a coach of, you know, trying to create the the correct mental approach and the correct routines and the tactics that suit a player's game best, particularly in certain matchups. And also, like, 
sometimes building up strengths, getting better at the things you're already good at. And ultimately, I would say last couple of years with Djokovic, you, you look at a shot like his forehand, which I think he's leaned more and more heavily on in the last couple of years. That's kind of an example of, okay, we are, there's not a problem with the forehand, but we're going to try to keep adding two, three, four percent to continue to make gains in whatever area we can. Overhead thing, that's mental, right? I don't think there's anything wrong with this overhead technically. I mean, maybe there is, and you know, I'm not the biggest, uh, not the biggest like technique guru where like maybe somebody would find an issue with it, but looks fine to me. I just think it's mental. Forehand drop shots, that's an interesting one. I will admit, I am skeptical that Novak has spent a lot of time trying to develop that and add it to his toolkit, and I do think it would be an interesting one for him to play with. So I do like that suggestion. Uh, but the last thing I'll bring up is the motivational factor, right? I feel like we're all in agreement that the biggest thing for Djokovic in this next phase of his career is motivation, like staying hungry. And I would not discount the role that a coach can play in pushing a player, extracting the maximum work ethic out of a player. That is part of a coach's job. Is there somebody out there who, no who Novak would trust to come in and be a bit of a disciplinarian, be somebody who might bring the best out of Novak motivationally? I don't know. Maybe that person doesn't exist. Maybe they do. But I think if you're going to ask me, what would be the best thing Novak could find in a coach? It would be a coach that gets Novak excited about putting in the really, really hard yards. That's, that would be my answer. All right. This next one is related. From Mr. Black Global. ATP WTA plot twist. Goran Ivanisevic has been announced as Elena Rybakina's new coach. What do you think, Gil? What can Goran add or improve in Elena's game? In a recent interview, she mentioned her aspiration to be the number one player in the WTA. Can Goran help her achieve this goal? I, I think so. I really do. Here's what I think is going to be the biggest difference between Ivan Isevich and Rybak and his former coach, Stefano Vukov. Vukov became notorious, developed a reputation around the tour for being a tough love guy. He was hard on Elena. He probably created a pretty stressful environment for Elena Rybakina. And it's worth noting, at every step of the way, at least publicly, Rybakina defended Vukov and said, look, if I didn't like the way he was coaching me, I would fire him. And fair enough. And I don't know what happened at the end there. And if things fell apart in, in an ugly way, in a you know cordial way, I don't know and I don't choose to speculate, although many are. The point is, that is not going to be Goran. Not even close. While Ivan Isevich certainly can get down to business, he is going to bring some levity. He is going to bring probably some, some much-needed uh, depressure, depressurizing to Rybakina. And it's going to be interesting to see how that change in approach might affect Elena. I think the biggest hope is that for Rybakina, it's going to allow her to stay healthier because it's just like something is off. Something is abnormal about how often in the last couple of years her health has deteriorated. And maybe it's genetic. I don't know, right? Like she's got maybe bad allergies that nobody can figure, figure out what it is. And some players are just more injury prone. For Rybakina, it's just been a little bit strange because normally it's not like soft tissue muscle injuries or anything like you'll see with the Carolina Muhova. A lot of the times it's been illness. And I don't know, like there's just a lot out there. Like stress, stress has a lot of really adverse effects on a player. And I would never feel comfortable to say with a lot of conviction that Vukov's coaching style caused Rybakina to miss as much time as she had over the last 
as she has over the last two years. But at least with Ivanisevic, you try something different and you see if it makes a difference because I'm telling you, it's just going to feel different for her out there. And hopefully she rediscovers a different level of joy for the game that maybe she was having trouble finding both in training and in the matches. And I just think that can be something that's really legitimately valuable. So again, we focus on the technical stuff with the coaching, but there's so much like interpersonal dynamics and you have to remember, you're traveling with these people all the time. You're spending more time with with your coach and your team than you are your your family. And uh, this like personality stuff matters. From a technical standpoint, obviously it's intriguing because even Isevich, I talked about the fallacy of coaches coming in and just focusing on weaknesses, which is just not how coaches coach. And I'll I'll get like Paul Anacone on sometime and, and we'll talk about that on the podcast, I promise. Uh, the other fallacy is that coaches come in and they imprint their own games on their players, which often isn't the case, right? A great coach understands who they're working with and is malleable in terms of what their coaching is based on who they're working with. That's literally the definition of a good coach. You have to understand what are the capabilities here? How do we maximize those capabilities, right? The funny thing with with Ivanisevic is it kind of did break the rule. Like here's one of the best servers, one of the great servers in men's tennis. He comes on to Novak Djokovic's team. Because Marion Vida and Novak, they're like, we need help with the serve. We need a technique guru to come and clean this thing up and try to optimize this shot. And boy, did Ivanisevic do a kick-ass job. And Vida said it, and Novak has said it. He was the serve doctor. So now, now it's it's that with, look, I think Rybakin is the best serve on tour. I don't think it's Zhang Chin Wen. I don't. I think it's Rybakina just because of first serve percentage. If you look at ace rate, Rybakina and Zhang are about the same. Rybakina's got her beat by 0.1. If you look at first serve win percentage, Zhang is better by some distance. And by the way, when I say better, uh, Zhang is first last 52 weeks, first on tour. Rybakina is second. But if you look at first serve percentage, you've got, Elena at 61.7. You've got Zhang at 52.5. So I'll take the 9% better for serves in over the course of a year. That's pretty significant to me. I think Rybakina is slightly best serve on tour, in my opinion. Probably a better second serve than Osaka as well, because I think Naomi would want to be in that conversation. Um, yeah. Is Goran just going to be like, I'm not touching the serve. Bet, best serve in women's tennis, I'm not touching it. Or is he going to say, huh, talk about making strengths better. Maybe he sees something in that serve. Maybe it can get even better. If Goran feels like there is any inefficiency there, I think he's going to take the liberty to try to make what is already the best serve in tennis even better. All right, let's take a quick break, and then we'll get to the next question. This episode is brought to you by Melon. Look, people who've played tennis with me over the years will tell you, I've never been a hat guy. And that's because I felt the hat industry has a problem, which is that you wear a hat for a couple of weeks, you sweat in it, it starts smelling bad, you try to wash it, it loses its shape, it falls apart, and it's a mess. That has been my experience with every single hat until I discovered Melon. Because these hats are designed to be the most premium and durable in the world. If you need a hat that's going to keep up with you, no matter what you do, that's Melon. These hats are engineered with antimicrobial properties, not to use a big word on you, but that is why when you sweat in them, it doesn't stain and it doesn't smell. And if you ultimately need to wash these hats, it's not going to lose its shape and it's going to come back looking brand new. This is the Hydro Hat, my Melon hat of choice. It's been tested in lakes, oceans, and pools. It's built for the water. It's not going to fall apart in these situations. The style part is also really important. Everybody's got a different taste in hats. Melon understands that, so the selection is huge. There are tons of shapes and colors and styles, and there's even a fit finder on the website, so if you're not sure, like, what hat is right for me? What size is right for me? 
uh, the site can break down exactly which hat might suit you best uh, to kind of give you a help in that direction. If you're looking for a hat that you can sweat in, that you can play tennis in, you can do whatever you want in, and it's still gonna last you five times longer than any other hat, look no further. Go to melon.com. That is M E L I N.com and put it to the test yourself. From R.S. Tucker, can you explain the new direct to consumer package from Tennis Channel? Does it replace Tennis Channel Plus or is it only broadcasting whatever match slash programming is on the main channel? Thanks. All right, big news here. It was, uh, it will be in this week's edition of The Draw if you want to read up on it more. Uh, last week's edition was led actually by the Rebakina News and a press conference, uh, a transcript of her press conference. Um, I'm not going to go through last week's edition of The Draw, but just remember you can go to thedraw.tennis for my weekly curation of the best tennis content on the internet. Link will also be in the description to subscribe to that. Uh, all right, the news is Tennis Channel is launching a direct-to-consumer product. What that means is you will no longer need a cable subscription to uh, gain access to Tennis Channel, which is a big deal because young people increasingly do not have cable subscriptions. You have probably heard of the, the cord-cutting movement. The number of people in the United States, probably true worldwide with whatever equivalent there is, uh, the number of people with cable subscriptions goes down every single year. And it is why networks like Tennis Channel have been forced to innovate. And that has come, you know, good and bad. I think as a sports fan, the bad part of it is you need a lot of subscriptions now. And that can get ex expensive when they add up. But it, if you're looking, if you're a tennis fan in isolation and you are someone who, look, I'm not going to get into the financials of it on an individual basis. But the point is, the point is, if the only reason why you might, if you don't have a cable subscription and you want Tennis Channel, you now have an option. You used to have none. And I think that's a huge deal for the accessibility of the network in the younger demos especially. Now, it's not a TC Plus replacement uh, because if you want like a la carte streaming options and on-demand viewing of matches, I do believe TC, you still need TC Plus for that. You can watch whatever court you'd like. But if you want the kind of beefed up you know, substantial highest grade uh, coverage that is offered on Tennis Channel, now you're able to access it digitally through streaming. That used to never be the case. So I think this is great news for American tennis fans. I'll just say that. Uh, conflicts disclosed. I am a regular contracted broadcaster for Tennis Channel, and therefore uh, I, uh, I speak with that. Uh, as my uh, background. But next one from Johnny Joe 65 Hi, Gil. I find it interesting how the electoral college voting system has remarkable similarities to the tennis scoring system. You can lose the popular vote, but still win the election. Kind of like how you can win a match, but lose more total points. Also, how voting for Democrats in, say, Massachusetts is like a throwaway point in tennis. Votes in swing slash battleground states have a lot more value than others, sort of like the value of tiebreaker points. Thoughts? All right, I wanted to reward this comment for the pure creativity uh, because, no, I've never thought about this, but I, now I have. Okay, one difference, Johnny Joe. If you are a voter in a clear blue state or a clear red state, you know your vote doesn't count. Whereas in tennis, you might play a 40 love point that you think doesn't count, but you win it, you win 40-15, now we're kind of, okay, we feel like we might get into this game, now it's deuce, suddenly the 40 love point counted. You didn't know at the time how much it mattered. But turns out, on Monday Match Analysis the next day, when I am just grilling this person for uh, a lack of discipline on the 40 love point because... They, they lost their focus on it, 
and it ended up being really important, you know, that kind of thing can happen. So that's about the closest to get, uh, the, the closest we'll get to talking politics on the program. Uh, next one is from Malakat. Hey, Gil, hope you're doing well. I'm curious about your thoughts on the recent success of certain players. Example, Pericar, Draper, Feast, etc., and whether or not that success will translate over to 2025. We've seen instances of players having a great post-U.S. Open stretch like FAA, for example, and go on to have a pretty uneventful next season. Will this be the case for these players, or will their performance and results only improve going forward? Thanks for all you do, Gil. Again, I hope you're doing well and enjoy the holiday season. Appreciate it. Well, the players you named, I mean, Perry Carr, Draper, and Fees. In the case of Draper, my opinion on him hasn't changed. You know that for a long time, I've looked at what he's capable of, his skills on the court, and I've regarded him as a top prospect, right? So, yeah, he's done well into our hardcourt season, but opinion ultimately doesn't change. I expect that he's going to be at the top of the sport for years to come. Arthur Fees, I don't hold him in quite the same level as Draper, but close, like almost there. And I think he has the potential to also be uh, an an elite player down the road. I think the tools are there in terms of raw athleticism uh, and a lot of the ball striking stuff that Feast is capable of. And I love the mental, which I, I guess I've only realized recently how much I love the mental. It's taken me, you know, a little while of getting to know Ar- Arthur to kind of get there on him. But yeah, I mean, no, I think, I think Feast has had taken his lumps, honestly, 2024. I think 2025 will probably be the best year of his career. Cause I think he spent a lot of this year, a little bit lost, uh, pressing somewhat anxious that the results weren't coming easier, losing his identity a bit, lacking some consistency, and then Perry Card, for him, it's pretty simple, right? He has a weapon in his serve that's going to give him an exceptionally high floor. Like you can basically put your, <laughs> do I want to say this? You can basically swear on your mortgage uh, or put your mortgage on the fact that Perry Carr at some point is going to be a top 20 player. That's what his serve, that's the, assurance that his serve offers. It's just going to be now a very kind of long journey in development of figuring out, can he break serve more than like 13, 15% of the time? I think this year he's around like the 11% break rate mark. Now, if he, if he stays at 11% and he can't figure out a way to break serve more often, that's also going to kind of limit him. But that's, you know, he's got a lot of runway now over the next few years to just try to get better in that area. I don't see any of the guys who you named as like fluky indoor hardcore runs because we do see that sometimes. But Perry Carr, Draper, and Feast, no, I think both of, I think all three of them are on a legitimate upward trajectory and it will stay there. From my paralysis. Hey, Gil, love your content. Definitely my favorite tennis channel. Thank you. My question is, do you think we will see a new Grand Slam winner next year? And if so, who do you think will be on the list of people to possibly break through and win their first slam? Big question. I would say right now, the gap with Sinner and Alcaraz is substantial enough. And then there's always kind of the possibility that Djokovic kind of regains something here in uh in 2025 possibility. Although I don't I don't think we're going to see a consistent Novak ever again. I don't think we're going to get Djokovic at a top level all year long again, but we could see flashes of it. We could get the peaking for a slam kind of thing for for Novak. So obviously Djokovic would be a p- potential slam winner, wouldn't be the first time. Then you have Sinner and Alcaraz. But I just think at the moment, because Sinner and Alcaraz have seemed to create like a pretty pretty decent gap, considering some of, well, I'll get to the rest. I would say 55% chance, just my number in my head, 55% chance we don't see a new slam winner next year. 
which means there's a decent chance we do. Who are the two guys who I could most mostly see it for? Well, Alexander Zverev, because in level, he's the closest. He actually reminds me quite a bit of Daniil Medvedev in 2021. Because if I were to get the question right now, Gil, what does Zverev need to do to win a major? I would mostly tell you, like, he's just got to do it. I, I don't have much more there because I do think he has made gains and improvements on his serve. There are subtle things that I would like to maybe see him do even better on the serve. Uh, he, I think he understands that when he's hitting the forehand with conviction, dictating off of that wing, not dropping the ball short, not going cross court every time, and actually threatening down the line, uh, being unpredictable in terms of his direction off of that wing and doing all of those things, and not decelerating, not getting tight on the forehand. Applying some forward pressure. Doesn't have to be net rushing constantly, but also like not just getting really, really passive against the very best in the world. I think Zverev knows he needs to do that. It just becomes a mental thing. So Zverev has the level. He has the capability. He's just got to do it. And that's the only thing that he can do at this time. I don't think it's a matter of development. I think it's a matter of being in that moment and finding it, finding enough, and maybe opportunity opening up, right? Like for Medvedev, what was opportunity? It was Djokovic going for the career Grand Slam and playing that entire U.S. Open really, really tight, being like mentally and physically completely fried in the final. That was opportunity. So maybe for Zverev, it'll be opportunity. And if he gets that, I think he might be able to take advantage if he can hold his nerve. So Zverev is the first guy because he's really, really close. Draper would be my second name because if he takes another leap in his development, which I think is a possibility, he might kind of catapult himself up there. I've said before, I don't really see it for Fritz. I, I just think he would need some draw luck. I don't really see it for Rude. I don't really see it for Demonor or Rublev or Dimitrov or Tsitsipas. Yeah, I mean, so Draper um, Draper would be the guy other than Zverev. Yeah. All right, let's go to the next one. From Hayden. Hi, Gil. Some people aren't excited about Kaspar Rude being in Turin. Do you think his efforts in the clay season warrant a position in the final eight? If not, who would you replace him with? Yeah, it yeah, he warrants a position in the final eight. Like, look, the year end championships is not a competition of like, let's put together all the players who have the best chance of winning the year end championships. That's not what this is. This is the top eight for the season get to play this event. That's how it should be, and that's how it is. So, look, Casper, not just on clay courts, on all surfaces, had, an, had a very, very, very good first half of the year. From Australian Open to Roland Garros. He won, he won a round, I have it in my notes somewhere here. He basically won like 40 matches in the first half of the year. And right now, he's won like 10 since. Right, So he wins 40 matches from Australian Open to Roland Garros, and he wins about 10 matches from Roland Garros to the end of the year. I mean, yeah, he's had a lopsided year. There's no doubt about it. He comes in in probably worse form than I can ever remember somebody coming into the year on championships. He's lost, I, I believe, seven of his last eight matches. I can, I can look for it because obviously I actually called his match against Bonzi, at least some of it. Um, so I know I have this written down here. Where is it? Nah, I couldn't find it. I'm not going to spend more time looking for it. He's lost like seven out of his eight. Uh, but yeah, he, he deserves to be in it because he had a huge first half. And that put him in the top eight at the end of the year. That's how, that's how it goes. Here's another funny one with Rude. He has only made one indoor hardcore semifinal in his career. And he's 26 years old. But that one semifinal 
was the ATP Finals in Turin 2022. Could you imagine if like he retires and his only indoor hardcourt semifinal is at the year-end championships? That would be bizarre. So we'll see what happens with Casper. I mean, I certainly don't like his chances. Next one is from Nadal Brought Me to Tennis. Hi, Gil. This question is about Tsitsipas. In Gruskin's recent analysis of his loss against Fies, he seemed to think his difficulties were more due to a maybe shot-related deficits and surface-related. Do you agree? Or do you think there are mental challenges, namely confidence? I don't even know. I know even he has cited lack of motivation as an issue, but I've wondered if lack of confidence is behind it all. Uh, do you see him rising again in the near future? Thanks as always. Are you giving me an invitation to just slam Gruskin and he doesn't, he's not even here to defend himself? I'll take that any day of the week. Yeah, I, I disagree with Gruskin. I actually think that we've argued about this in the past. I'm, I'm very much anti the idea that Tsitsipas is struggling in 2024 because his return isn't good and he doesn't defend well with his backhand and he gets rushed on quick surfaces. I'm so not into that. Because when Tsitsipas finished year-end number four, back-to-back -back years, you don't need to go back very far, uh, 2021 and 2022, year-end four, back-to-back -back years, guess what? His backhand return wasn't very good. His backhand defense wasn't very good. Everybody knew it. Let, don't act like people discovered it last year. Like people were like, oh, I should serve his backhand. Why didn't we think of that? No. Tsitsipas' weakness, it's easy when somebody's struggling to just say, oh, it's the weaknesses. The weaknesses were always the weaknesses. The strengths have actually deteriorated. And I do believe there's been a big confidence issue. I think that he has struggled with the young guys coming up and beating him when at a certain point in his career, when he was kind of battling against the big three, they were these larger-than-life figures in the sport. Tsitsipas was playing them well. I think Stefanos was like, I think he thought, I'm the, I'm the man. These guys are about to go away, and this is going to be my shit. I'm going to own this. And... I just think when when Alcaraz came up and started beating him, uh, it it did take a mental toll, and I think there's been some panic for Tsitsipas. I do, due to that confidence issue that I I'm not, you know, I don't have solutions here. I'm not I'm not confident in what I'm doing. Uh, I think there's been evidence of that. He has spent the last two years tinkering with his technology. Uh, there was a time where some of it was, you know, injury related, but I, I know that he continues to play with his racket technology over the course of the last two years. Again, if we're going just hard evidence, uh, the, the serve technique change in Australia this year, which I also wanted to say was because of his back. But when Tsitsipas tells you multiple times, it's not because of his back. He said, it's not because of my injury. I actually believe him. I actually think that he was looking for some solutions and trying to find something extra. Uh, to me, very ill-informed, very silly. He was second on tour in holds rate last year. And uh, that, has, that has gone downhill, right? And he was second in holds rate last year because of his, his serving prowess. And his forehand, right? So how come that has gone away? Not because of his backhand return, right? Because now Alcaraz is, let's see, I'm going to count for a second. He's 12th in 2024 in hold rate when he was second last year. Um, let me go, let me take a closer look here. Uh, ace rate is down. Uh, lower than last two years. First serve percentage down, lower than it's been the last two years. 
Surf, first serve win percentage way down. It was actually excellent last year. It was actually the best year of his career was last year, but it's it's way down now. It's the lowest it's been since actually his entire career. He's never lost more points with his first serve than than this year. I'm looking at the stats right now. So it's the deterioration of his strengths, what he's good at. That's what's been an issue for him, not the weaknesses. And there also have been injuries. He has not stayed as healthy as uh, he would need to. There have been some right elbow issues. There have been some right shoulder issues. Um, obviously, there has been the the confidence goes in hand with the stuff that's happened with his coaching, right? Those things are connected because one of the things that a coach does is they come in and they give you conviction and confidence in the things you're doing. They give you structure. This is our process before and after a match. These are our tactics. This is how we train. There's stability there. There's, there's a voice in your corner who is providing some insurance uh, that, that this is how we're going to do things and we're not going to question we're not going to question how we're doing things. We're going to have confidence in our processes. I think Titi Pass is, has been flailing the last two years, trying this, trying that, and and really just, you know, kind of desperately searching for solutions because there's been a lot of funky stuff that have kind of popped up here and there in his matches. Now, the positive thing is, of course, he has finally made that split with Apostolos, and I think there's a lot of reason for optimism. If you're a Titi Pass fan, you're going into 2025. Hopeful, hopeful that although this year was difficult, ultimately, it was the rock bottom moment that he needed to turn the page and enter a new era, but he needs to bring someone in who's going to give him structure and confidence. That's what he needs. And the back end is going to continue to be a weakness and on quick surfaces, that return is never going to be stellar. Tsitsipas has proven he doesn't need to fix those things to be a top five player. He doesn't. He needs to get back to doing well uh, the things that that he has shown capable of doing well. Competing mentally at the best of his capabilities, hitting great first serves, great forehands, coming forward, using his athleticism from the back of the court to extend rallies. These are the things he needs to get back to. I feel like I had one more point, but I did go quite long on that, so I'm just going to move on. Uh, from Geezer, Gil, what do you think the legacy of Alcaraz's 2024 season will be? I think the legacy is going to be he won two slams. He won the channel double. Youngest player to ever win the channel double. Uh, beat Djokovic in the Wimbledon final again, right? They're going to they're going to write the story of the epic of 2023, five sets, Alcaraz's, you know, true, I would say, it wasn't his arrival, right? Everybody knew he was already, like, elite. But I think that vaulted him to, I'd say, another level of, uh, you know, respect, I would say, in terms of just taking down Djokovic in a Wimbledon final, ending a, a very dominant Wimbledon history, you know, run for Novak from the late 2010s into the early 2020s. Uh, obviously, there's some context on the Wimbledon win uh, that he had this year with Djokovic's health declining, but that's part of the story as well, right? Like when we're looking back at this point in history, it's going to be an aging Djokovic looking to fend off decline. Of course, Novak getting the big win at the Olympics is actually probably the headliner of the 2024 season, other than Yannick Sinner's emergence as the number one player in the world. I think those are actually the two headliners. But if you're asking me what will Alcaraz's legacy be, one, two slams, youngest ever to win the channel double. Um, and nobody, like ultimately, the inconsistencies of this season will not really be like it's not going to be significant five years from now unless the inconsistencies just become a part of who Alcaraz is moving forward. And then that's a completely different conversation. 
Uh, but yeah, don't underestimate like how simple legacies become. Folks are going to look back at Alcaraz's 2024, two slams, great year, period. That's how it works in this game. You win two slams, you had a great year. That's it. Next one is from member Yannick Murray. You can become a member by hitting the join button, contribute to the channel, $2 a month. It is a massive, massive help. I appreciate all my members so, so much. Hey, Gil, I was shocked to see that Murray versus Nadal as a grass court player was being debated on X, and there is even a tendency to favor Rafa. Two Wimbledon titles each, but Andy has a higher win percentage, 79.5 compared to Rafa's 72.2, and Andy has more grass court titles, seven versus four. Uh, Andy also went on a run between 2008 and 2017 of reaching at least the quarterfinal in 11 consecutive Wimbledons, also including four semifinals, one final, and two titles. Rafa went four consecutive years losing to players outside the top 100 between 2012 and 2016. Sorry for the long question. Are you sure about that? Was, was Gilles Mueller outside the top? Or, or was that 2017? Maybe that was 17. Anyway, uh, sorry for the long question. Could you weigh in for me? All right, look, you make a good, good case. Like, statistically, if you're putting everything together, yeah, Andy Murray's probably the better grass court player. We can debate the reasons for that. And while Andy's game was certainly better suited for grass... There's a massive difference in prioritization there, right? What Murray did at Wimbledon was always going to basically define his legacy. Whereas it was very important for Rafa after he became a dominant force on the clay courts that he ultimately won Wimbledon. In fact, that became Rafa's chief goal very early on, especially 2007, 2008. Once he did it, and then once he got a little bit older, you definitely saw that there was a you know, a bit of, I wouldn't say a decline in the desire to win Wimbledon, but I would say an increase in the prioritization of Roland Garros because Rafa put his body through the ringer for that clay court stretch. Part of it was because of proximity. The fact that Barcelona 500 was in Spain and Monte Carlo was a non-mandatory Masters 1000, not one that Rafa was willing to skip. Madrid, another home tournament. So it, it just became this insane schedule. And then for a long time, there's only two weeks between Roland Garros and Wimbledon, and that include, includes the stretch that you're mentioning from, um, you know, where, where Rafa suffered the string of early defeats at Wimbledon. I, I think part of it was Nadal really struggled to prepare himself for Wimbledon because of the, the calendar stuff. He wasn't really able to rest and prepare at the same time. That's not how preparation works. He had knee, he had knee issues, and I think he struggled uh, getting down low on the grass courts and moving on the grass courts when he was having the knee issues. So there are all of these reasons why Wimbledon got tough on Rafa, but you also take nothing away from Murray. I mean, he his game was like beautiful on grass. He was a fantastic mover on the grass. You know, that flat backhand that is is so precise in his ability to maneuver it around the court. Such an awesome grass court weapon. The <clears throat> the the second serve return, how early he could take it, super deadly. Gave him the ability to really dominate second serve return points on the grass. And then even the way his second serve was constructed, where, it, you know, the, the slice serve was pretty difficult to attack because sometimes it would kind of skid through the court, wouldn't really bounce up. So... I could go on and on about this stuff. Obviously, for Murray, you could also flip it around and be like, clay court season was his worst. So you had the reverse dynamic. You know, Andy wanted to peak for grass. Rafa wanted to peak for clay. And again, you laid out the numbers here. Andy ended up having a better grass career than Rafa. All right, from Tank. Daniil doesn't win a title uh, this year, but still managed to get to number four in the race. Will you prefer his results or like a Rublev who wins a Masters but just gets lucky to get an ATP Finals? All right, he didn't get lucky, all right? When you win a Masters and you make another Masters 1000 Final, that's a lot of points. You have a huge leg up, and, uh, you know, it's not like Andre did nothing other than that. He just went on a bunch of losing streaks this year, ultimately. Like, he went on two separate four-match losing streaks, which is very un like but that was part of his season. All right. The question, though, is comes down, you know, to like 
What's better, titles or consistency? Here's my thoughts on this. What indicates the better tennis player? In my opinion, consistency indicates the better tennis player. Meaning I think normally the, the more consistent player across the board, even if that player doesn't manage to have a title run, usually that player who accumulated a much better win-loss record, who was uh, putting themselves in the mix at the end of tournaments on a week-to-week basis, normally that player is actually technically, I think, the better player. However, from a statistical standpoint and from a legacy standpoint, titles matter more. Like Titles actually add to your resume in a more significant way than consistency does. And there's some stuff with consistency, like I think year-end ranking matters. If I can look at a guy and say, like I can look at Medvedev and say, okay, how many years in a row has he, oh, well, there's the one year he slipped out. But um, let's see. I can look at Medvedev and say, looking at his year-end rankings here, that, okay, it's going to be five out of the last six years he finishes top five in the rankings. And 2024 is going to be included in that. And it just goes to show you for Medvedev when you're making an argument about how good he was as a player. Man, I mean, he was top five at the end of the year almost every year. So that matters a little bit. But what matters even more is, okay, what big tournaments did you win? And for Rublev, he he tacks on a Masters 1000. Um, and he tacks on... Um, you know, titles. And to me, that will actually have more of a lasting impact on his resume. So legacy wise, Rublev had a better year. Is there an argument that Andre was a better tennis player throughout the year? That's where I would, I would say no. And I'd give it to Medvedev. I hope that makes sense. All right. Last one from David Hughes. Roddick said the two week masters 1000 sucks. And this is what Tsitsipas had to say. Quote, the two-week Masters 1000s have turned into a drag. The quality has definitely dropped. Players aren't getting the recovery or training time they need. With constant matches and no space for the intense work off the court. It's ironic that ATP Tour committed to this format without knowing if it could actually improve the schedule. But the quality, likewise. Uh, Paris got it right. Done in a week. Exciting and easy to follow. Just how it's supposed to be. If the goal was to ease the calendar, extending every 1,000 to two weeks is a backwards move. Sometimes it feels like they're fixing what wasn't broken. What do you think? Look, we have talked about this in the past, but Andy is right, and Stefanos is right. Um, and let me just expand on what they're describing in case it's unclear. If you want to do if you want to do the kind of work that is going to prevent injury in the future, that is going to be tough work in the gym where you're probably lifting heavier and pushing your body a little bit harder off the court to, you know, target certain muscle groups um, in, the, in the hope of, yeah, sometimes getting stronger and more explosive, but also from an injury prevention standpoint. You can't do that during a tournament because you, you end up making yourself sore, fatiguing your muscles, reducing your ability to perform, exerting energy, like all of this stuff. So you want some training blocks during the year where you're putting you know four or five days in a row in the gym, really pushing your body to the max to the point where your practice sessions on court might be a little bit compromised by what you're doing in the gym but ultimately that's going to pay out that's going to pay off with your ability to stay healthy and withstand the rigors of the tour. So the two week masters 1000s make it so that there are less off weeks for the players. And the ATP coming in was like, "Hey, this is great. Off days between matches. Everybody's going to be way more wet rested." And it just hasn't played out that way. They also thought that it was going to be more entertaining for the fans because you're stretching out the premium product because there are more weeks on the calendar where there are Masters 1000s. At the end of the day, I I will defend Andrea Gaudenzi on one front. A lot of the logic made sense on paper. In practice, in practice, it is not working. 
it was an it is an ill conceived idea. And the hope is that there's enough flexibility here where they can reverse course on what previously seemed like a good idea, and it turns out it's not a good idea. So are they flexible? Can they audible? Can they hear the feedback? Because nobody likes this. And it was a choice that the tour made. Um, you know, maybe there can be a little bit of a hybrid system instead of, uh, you know, where instead of the 12-day masters, maybe they can... Uh, push it to, um, I don't know. It's tough. You know, I, I won't brainstorm right now. I do have some ideas. I'll save it for another time. Um, I do like the fact that these tournaments get an extra weekend, but ultimately it just hasn't really been worth the the downsides. So that's all I got for this week. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.